So ATLS is a very uh, very elusive term. ATLS. Okay, it has been there. You see, it's 400 pages. He says difficult to actually figure out how to talk about ATLS in the exam. See, believe me, even I had a problem when I was actually getting ATLS for the exam. Even you would have had a problem. Ki kya bande ka ATLS mein? Huh? It's so much. But there are a few things that uh, that comes in ATLS that we all should know when it comes to uh, practical management of patients in the on the field or in the intensive care unit. When it comes to ATLS, okay, and that. Uh, ATLS is a defined method which has to be done the same time or the same uh, way in the same order. ATLS is a defined method of uh, of uh, examining a patient and finding out the problems uh, uh, in the same manner, in the same order, in the same time. That's how it's supposed to be done. Okay. And how did ATLS come is very interesting. I don't know whether you all know Dr. Steiner. Dr. Steiner was an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Dr. Steiner was an orthopedic surgeon. He used to fly planes. Okay, so one day he was flying over Nebraska, and his his mother, his, his wife, and his three children were there with him. Okay, on the plane, and uh, it happened that as he was flying over, at that time there was nothing like ATLS. There's nothing like ATLS at that time. Okay, he was flying over Nebraska. His plane crashed. When his plane crashed, he's an orthopedic surgeon himself. He became he was not very badly injured. <coughs> but unfortunately, his wife died on the spot because part of the engine went into her head, and she died on the spot. And there were three children of which they all had severe previous injuries. And the story goes this way that at that time, you know, he extricated them to different places so that they could be away from fire, they could be away from all those things. He did that at that particular moment. And then he had to, it took a long time before he could flag down somebody uh, from on the road uh, to take him to the hospital. Okay, so they, six people, seven people, six people were in one car. Six people were in one car, stories like the six people were in one car went uh, from uh, from that field to the hospital that was some hours away and when they reached the primary rural health center of nebraska the doctor who came in after two or three uh, after one or one hour or two hours doctor that came in uh, a surgeon who came in did not know what to do because there were so many things happening so uh, he did not know what to do he was completely uh, not understanding what is to be done in such case okay so he just realized that i lost so much of time in that one hour that he came in over there so much of time that um, he could have done a better job with his children. Steiner, Dr. Steiner. Okay, so he just realized that it is a huge confusion when it comes to trauma. It's a huge confusion when it comes to trauma, and that is the reason he wanted to regularize this. So he moved the patient from this rural hospital to Lincoln Hospital, which is near uh, in a, a larger hospital. I moved it to Lincoln Hospital, met the surgeon there, and then they took the call that we want to make a protocol where we could actually salvage these patients and do it the same time every time. Because at the end of the day, a motor vehicle collision is a collision, is a traffic accident, is a trauma. So let us have one umbrella to manage all these patients. And that is the reason that they developed a protocol, tried to implement the protocol. In 1978, the first ATLS protocol came in. Some of you will not be born at that time. Okay, 1978, the first uh, uh, protocol came in. Right, ATLS. And then, it, it was this way that every four years it gets changed. So if you want to see it, you should see it every four years. Because what happens is every four years they actually look at the protocol, they look at the evidence that is coming in, and then they alter the protocol accordingly. So what protocol you had seen as 400 pages, maybe the 2023 protocol, uh, uh, which is a very large, extensive protocol, and they keep changing it every time. We don't need to know the whole thing. First of all, we don't need to know the whole thing when we are dealing with intensive care unit because we need to know just ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. Something that you do every time that a patient comes into you with trauma. Okay, so classically this is an emergency room protocol, but you know we have to do it. We have to know it because we are, after all, critical care physicians that we have to know emergency as well as um, intensive care. The entire point is we should know everything. That's the uh, uh, thing that we have. We never know where, 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 we to, where we are going to go. That's why ATLS protocol is something we all should know. Okay, because the history of ATLS. Huh? So uh, Dr. Saina after that made this protocol. I don't know with the name of Dr. William of Connell. So it's Fat Connell or something his name was. I don't exactly remember his name. Uh, but they together it's a surgeon. So it's actually a surgeon based protocol. So surgery, uh, why am I telling you this? Because surgeons always make things very simple. If you look at surgeons, they have very simple ideas. They don't have complex ideas. Anything that is complex, go to the physician. Okay, so very simple ideas. They will say, Isakoro, Isakoro, Isakoro. Huh? Why, why, why would they do that? Because they don't want to make it complex. That's the usual thing that surgeons have. I, I can cut, I can scrape, I can I can I, I can tie. Huh? But they cannot do anything more complex than that. And so that's why this protocol is not complex. It's very simple. Huh? And and, and the, the background behind this protocol is 
you identify a problem and treat the problem and, and also look for potential threats. So the, what is the background? You identify a problem, look for a potential threat and treat the problem. So there are three parts of this protocol. Of every part we are going to look at, there would be identify the problem, look for a potential threat, okay, and treat the uh, problem if, if you find a problem. So that's how you will progress in every part of the protocol. And everyone knows that the protocol has A, B, C, D, E. Okay, that is the protocol. A, B, C, D. Now, Kalanta has not put E in there, but A, B, C, D. Okay, so when you say A, what is A for? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you're going to look at the airway. The first thing in, in an ATLS protocol is look at the airway. What do you think we should look at? How do you say that this patient is safe? Any patient that is there in the ICU, how do you say that the patient is safe? Speak to the patient. And? Uh, this patient is talking to you, the airway is better. Well. Correct. So the answer is, if the person can talk to you, if the person can talk to you, yeah. it means that this patient's airway is patent and normal at that point. At that point. So what we understand with trauma is that what is now right may not be right in some time. May not be right in some time. And that is why you need to know the potential threat we have. You got, got the point? So I'm looking at the airway. Now I'm going to look at the potential threat. Now how do you find a potential threat? What do you feel in the airway? Uh, obstruction, any, um... No, no, so he's talking to you. You have to find a potential threat. Understand the question. Right. Huh? You have a, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. So you should understand a potential threat. Bleeding, so, bleeding, bleeding. Yeah, exactly, bleeding. exactly. So when a, the primary survey will involve you to first, when you're looking at the airway, to actually look at whether there is any bleeding anywhere, especially the nasopharyngeal bleeds that might go down and obstruct. Huh? So that is why you have to look at the nostril, you have to look at the mouth, you have to look at the bleeding that is occurring over there. Okay, that will give you an idea that there is going to be a potential threat. That is one potential threat. Then anything you can remember? Airway potential threat? Sorry? Burns, burns different. Let's not get into burns. You are right. Burns, if there is a facial burns, it's a potential threat. Okay, but yes, that's a potential threat. If there are facial burns, nasal hair changing. It's a potential threat. Okay, he's right on that. Under burns. Okay, then. Can you survive the next Uh, let's go to that. Uh, before, before that, before that. Airway obstruction like the teeth and roll. Yeah. So, so you have to look for fractures. Fractures, uh, fractures yes. across the bones, which is a potential threat. Why is it a potential threat? Because if there's fractures which are unstable, this will catch edema, 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 and then obstruct the airway. Huh? Potential threat is a fracture. Huh? Right? Clear? Clear? Huh? So, first is very simple, airway. Huh? So, how do you treat it? Now, this, since we said first airway, we under, uh, analyze the airway, we look at the potential threat that can the airway can face. Okay? And then we go to uh, treatment. So, if you have a potentially difficult airway, that means a patient who's ha already had some bleeding or something like that, whose GCS is on the lower side, you would probably want to, it, ATLS is very similar, it's like GCS in ATLS is proper. We say no, less than 8, don't intubate and all nowadays, let, let us take some time, it is okay. But in ATLS, no, if the patient's GCS is low, just intubate. You understand, no? if, the, if the GCS is low, just intubate. The altered mental status may be because of a traumatic brain injury which will actually require intubation. Are you understanding? Huh? You got the point. Huh? What we talk about, you know, less than 8, do not intubate, wait, wait, that is all hypercardia, things of proxidromes, poisoning, benzodiazepine overdose. Usme sab hai. Because you wait for some time, it will move, move out. But the potential pathology in ATLS is not going to move out. You, you understand? That's why if you have a patient whose GCS is low, don't think, intubate. <coughs> okay, don't think, intubate. Clear understanding? Huh? So that is a potential threat. That's a potential threat. Okay, so GCS low is a potential threat. Intubate. Altered mental status potential threat. Intubate because this is ATLS. Don't confuse that with other systems like poisoning, like anything else. You understand, no? ATLS, right? So normally we want to actually have a scale on this. Okay, the, the scale that you normally have when you come to GCS, what, what is the scale you require? What is the scale you will probably do? Anyone? Scale. ATLS. No, no. The better scale in, GC, in this is actually the ABPU scale. Okay, the better scale in ATLS is usually what is recommended is ABPU. What is ABPU? Alert, Alert. 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 verbal response, response to pain and unresponsiveness. 
right? So as you go higher on that, the potential threat to airway is there. As you go higher on that, the potential threat to airway. So AVPU scale. So you look at the AVPU scale. Usually when you look at trauma, we normally look at the alert visual pain and unresponsive scale. That's called the AVPU scale. That is very important for us because that will give us a potential threat. It will give us a potential threat, right? Huh? Okay, we have a potential threat. Now what do you do next? Okay. Still the most For traumatic brain injury, we are looking at ATLS. Okay, GCS is a part of traumatic brain injury, but when you are looking at ATLS, ATLS could be anything, no? It could be polytrauma, it could be trauma to the heart, trauma to the brain, or what? It could be anything. For that, ABPU. You got the point, huh? Alert visual pain and unresponsiveness, right? Huh? So. Uh, because when you look at traumatic brain injury, you will now go to pupil and all those things. Let's not. No, so that will come when you when you are actually assessing. When it comes to secondary survey, that will come. But when you are talking ATLS, this is what will come. Right? Huh? So potential threat airway. What do you do? Well, how do you manage this airway? You have to intubate. What what is ATLS? It's important for us to first stabilize the cervical spine. That is the most important thing in these cases. Stabilizing the cervical spine. Remember, this a high cervical spine will also be unstable because C3, C4, C5, the diaphragm can't go high. That's the mnemonic. C3, C4, C5, the diaphragm can't go high. That's what people talk. Okay. So anything in C3, C4, C5, the diaphragm may not work and that might cause another problem. Instability will worsen if you were to actually intubate these patients without, though now there are a lot of debates about these things. but. For ATLS purposes, as of now, let's not go to the debate. If there is a patient on uh, 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 on ATLS, usually they are spine boarded and collared. Usually, when an ATLS patient comes in from the ambulance, you, you, you are not in the ambulance, you know. If you are at the site, you'll probably be putting a cervical spine. But what happens in ATLS is this person is spine boarded and collared and brought to you. Okay, spine boarded and collared and brought to you. So when something like that occurs, you, when you're going to intubate your patient, you have to remove the cervical spine collar. You can't keep the cervical spine collar. Why? Then we won't get uh, and You can't extend, no. <laughs> How can you extend? Can you extend the neck? No. The reason to put the cervical collar is you don't extend, right? Uh, then what are you going to do? So the problem is, when you, what is known is that with the cervical collar in place, the intubation becomes rather difficult because mouth opening doesn't come. Okay, with the cervical, with an adequate cervical collar in place, you cannot open the mouth and that is the reason that intubation is also known to become very difficult with the cervical collar in place. That is why you need to do something called MIAS, which is, let's not go to controversies, but remember these terms for ATLS. For ATLS, you have to do MIAS, that is Manual Inline Axial Stabilization. What does that mean? How do you do that Manual Inline Axial? So before you go to Manual Inline Axial Stabilization, you have to keep all difficult airway equipment besides you, which includes up to cricothyrotomy and percutaneous tracheostomies. So in an ATLS uh, situation with a polytrauma patient, you cannot do intubation unless these things are ready along with ABCO. Huh? Unless these things are ready. Hello? Yeah, so what are we talking about? Now, so, uh, so before you do, you even try to remove the cervical collar, you should have right from everything, including laryngeal mask, airway, cricothyrotomy uh, uh, side, front of neck access, FONA, that is called front of neck access, all that has to be ready. Uh, we, don't, we don't really say cricothyrotomy uh, in, the, in the ATLS, you say FONA, uh, front, uh, uh, front of neck access, device is ready. Okay, we should have all of these things ready, including oral airway, when you are actually going to go ahead and you know, ventilate uh, this, uh, intubate these patients. These patients deserve bag mask ventilation and they also deserve those kind of uh, medicines that will not drop the blood pressure when you're actually going to intubate these patients. You don't intubate patients with rocuronium and, and atracurium and vacuronium and all these things. You intubate them with proper succinyl choline because it gives the best uh, conditions for intubation and shortest conditions for intubation, right? Huh? So in our country, at least, we would use choline to intubate these patients. Importantly, with every device that is available uh, that can uh, mitigate my difficult airway. Everything. You cannot start intubating an ATLS patient because you don't know what is inside. You don't know what is inside. It is one of the most difficult airways. And if people say it is simple to intubate these patients, boss, I have also worked in trauma and it is the most difficult thing <coughs> on earth. You can't see also anything inside very often. Okay, you open it and there is nothing you can see inside. Are you understanding? Huh? So you have to have everything ready before you go ahead and do 
um, uh, an intubation in these in these patients. So there's a small difference in intubation when it comes to traumatic brain injury, which we will discuss when we come to TBI. Okay, but otherwise uh, we have to intubate these patients with whatever possible with the presence of an ETCO2 for confirmation of tube. Right, there is no other way to confirm the tube. It is your right. Huh? So this this is the airway. Huh? The next thing that comes is B. And what is B? Breathing. breathing. Now how do you assess breathing? Just, 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 huh? just So A first a person who is not breathing well is not breathing well. He will see the person in a distress. The first thing is, is before you do you patient will be you know he's <laughs> not breathing well okay that's the first thing this inspection is always first okay so when you inspect you're going to see this you're going to see some bruises on his chest wall if there is you're going to inspect the chest wall you're going to see whether there is paradoxical movement in the chest after that okay after the patient is unable to you know he's in obvious distress then this comes over here you see an obvious saturation that is less than 90 percent on oxygen classically what is going to happen these patients will be coming from outside with oxygen on board and that or you can see the saturation there classically classically this is what you're going to see there right huh? so your oxygen is 80 85 percent you have an idea this is not okay this breathing is not okay this is not airway this is breathing okay huh? you're going to look at breathing over here you're going to see you're not going to send an ABC. So that's not the way you do it okay you are looking at breathing and you're looking at what is happening over here is this chest expanding properly or is it expanding in one place you have an idea Okay, in the event, in the event that the chest is not expanding and the patient is distressed, okay, and you have now, uh, of course, this is an advent of focus now, you probably look at the ultrasound and look at, but believe me, pneumothorax and ultrasound is difficult. Uh, it, is, it is not easy. Uh, we all talk about focus nice, beautifully, but you know, when we actually look at ultrasounds with pneumothorax, it's actually difficult. And at that moment, you know, the surgeons are sitting on your head. What happens in a usual emergency room is you have emergency physicians, you have trauma surgeon, you have yourself there as an intensive care doctor, you have two nurses, you have a radiographist, you have an ultrasound technician. It's very difficult to do all these things to uh, at one go by yourself. Okay, it's very difficult and you have to do it because that's how you progress. That's how you do it. Okay, you have to do it. So it is always a fight. If you go to a real AT, a trauma ward, and there's a fight. What are you doing nonsense? If this will go on. This is something that goes on. It's a huge conflict when you're actually inside the AT. That's why you have to follow the same technique. You want to say follow the same technique because this you will miss it out. Okay, so I'm breathing. If you find that one of the lungs is not moving, where the other is moving, and there is a hypotension, uh, uh, this is probably going to be pneumothorax. Uh, I'm not going to do a chest x-ray. It's wrong to do that. It is wrong to do that. Huh? It is wrong to say because the hypotension here is because there is no obvious bleeding source. Ob obviously, along with that, the focus will come. We'll come to that. Okay, and you find no other bleeding source, and there is hypotension. Then what is the cause of it? Tension pneumothorax. What do you do in tension pneumothorax? No, it is needle decompression. This is the problem when you ask in the exams in ATLS. When you ask in the exams in ATLS, what comes out splurts of your mouth is all wrong answers. It is not an ICD. Huh? It is needle decompression. You can't use an ICD. Okay, it's it's not supposed to be ICD. Okay, it's needle decompression. So what you blurt out in the exams is what you're going to do in the on, on, on your on your scene. You remember this, okay? Because in the exams you should subconscious. Huh? Exams is always subconscious. It's hardly you think. You don't, you don't get time to think, and you can't think because the exam is in front of you. Okay, you you will blurt out whatever you've been doing, and that is wrong. Okay, so that is a needle decompression. Needle decompression with a 14 gauge needle in the anterior axillary line, in the anterior mid line, mid line is what is supposed to do. Needle decompression. Tube thoracostomies come only after a focus. In tube thoracostomies will come only after a focus, which means that you find something there which is ecogenic or fluid in the in the in the chest and you think this hemothorax. Or tension pneumothorax, it is needle decompression. Clear? Needle decompression when it comes to tension pneumothorax. Clear on this? So you are going to look for a flail, you are going to look for flail chest, meaning flail chest where there is paradoxical motion and you are going to look at whether the chest is rising adequately or not. If there is breathing attempts that is much lower, less than 12, what do you assume? That there is some problem somewhere in the brain, that patient's GCS will be on the lower side. You are expecting the RR to be high, you are expecting the RR to be high. If your RR is low, there is something in the brain that is causing irregular respiration. You understand? That's what you are going to look at. Okay. But if the RR is high, what do you assume if the RR is high? A, there is some form of respiratory distress and it is not pneumothorax. There are many reasons for that. It could be pain. Fracture. It could be, it, the first thing is usually the common sign. The first is pain. The other thing, blood loss. Blood loss. 
the RR changes only when your blood loss is more than more than how do you categorize blood loss? How do you categorize blood loss? Class one, class two, class three, class one average. Class one is what? Class one is what? Less than fifteen percent. Less than fifteen percent. Class one is less than fifteen percent. Class two is. 15 to 30 percent class 2 class 3 is 30 to 40 percent and more than 40 percent is class 4 so usually when you reach 30 percent when you reach 30 percent is when you start changing showing changes in rr and changes in blood pressure okay changes in rr and changes in blood pressure occurs when the when the, this is around 30 percent so if everything else is normal and the patient is having rr that is high you can assume that there is 30 percent uh, uh, blood loss is probably what you're thinking at that stage you're going to probably think uh, we'll come when it comes to circulation we'll come to that okay so we want to show <coughs> potential threats so potential threats when looking at respiration is whether there is a flail chest why is it a potential threat why is flail chest a potential threat <laughs> yeah so okay, no not puncture what flail, flail chest is known to have contusional injuries so contusional injuries may cause other problems so it's a potential threat huh but breathing wise clear Huh? It's a potential threat breathing wise. Huh? But otherwise, the immediate threat for threat for that matter is pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, hemothorax. These are two immediate threats that you have. Okay. Uh, clear on this? Huh? Then the next thing that comes is circulation. Okay, now in circulation, what is what are you going to do in ATLS? In circulation. What are you going to do? Check for pulse. 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 So what do you, what do you understand by pulse? What do you understand by the pulse? Checking of pulse, and how do you check this? Fast. So the pulse is checked by feeling or whether you feel the pulse. So if you feel the pulse in the dorsalis pedis, your blood pressure is supposed to be around 90. If you feel the pulse in the radial, the, the pressure is around 80. If you feel the pulse in the femorals, the pressure is 70. If you feel in the carotid, it is 60. This is the ballpark figure in ATLS. This is the ballpark figure in ATLS. Okay. So it is 90, 80, 70 and 60. Okay. Huh? So you this is the ballpark figure. Okay. This is what you... You must say DP palpable. You that's how you do it. Okay. Huh? So dorsal speed is equally felt. It has to be equally felt. Why? Because it can be something else. Okay, if it's unequal, means there's vascular injury somewhere that's caused it, then you can't feel the pulse. Brachial plexus injury, you can't find the artery. Okay, so it has to be equally felt in all extremities, equally felt in all extremities, and if it is felt in whichever extremities it is, you note it down if this is what it is in circulation. This is exactly the place where you're actually going to look at uh, a very important examination called as E-FAST. Mm -hmm. This is exactly, of course, it doesn't come like airway ke time pe examination nahi karunga, but if you are the single person who's doing it, if you are the single person who's doing this, you're going to look at airway, breathing, circulation, and then in that circulation part, you're going to look at focus or E-FAST. What is E-FAST? Extended fast. Uh, what is FAST? Focus. What is FAST? Fast, full form? Focused uh, sonography in uh, stomach. Focus assessment of sonography in books. Focus assessment of sonography in books. Focus assessment of sonography in books. This is a problem. Focus. Focus. Focus is right. Focus. 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 It's not fast. I'm going, uh, it's not fast examination. People in the you know, ICU, some in hospitals, I'm going to ask fast, fast abdominal sonography for trauma. Mm -hmm. No, it's focused. focused. The answer is focused. That means fast is not fast. Fast is slow. You have to do your fast slow. It doesn't do. It is not fast. You have to spend time to get your fast right. Okay. You have to get uh, spend time to get the fast right. Okay. Fast has now been expanded to fast in when you do in trauma. In trauma, it is still cause fast. In trauma, it is still called fast. When it is a usual hypotensive patient in shock, it is called as rush. Okay. When it is fast, it is in trauma. But when it is a usual ultrasound examination in shock, it is called as rush examination. Okay. It is called rush. It is different. Huh? There is a small change. In fast, you are looking usually in the abdomen and the chest. With rush, you are looking at everywhere. Routine ultrasound for shock and Hypotension. Okay. So, uh, 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 rush is different. Okay. Rush is when you're looking for our ICU patients who's having shock or a patient who's not trauma. If the patient is not coming with trauma and is in the, in the ER or in the ICU, you will do a rush. 
but practically it overlaps. Practically everything overlaps. Like for example in Rush, you look at four views of the heart. Okay, then you look at uh, iota, then you look at pelvis, and then you look at pulmonary view. Okay, huh? uh, in what do you do in Rush? You look at the heart, you look at uh, 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 bilateral abdomen, uh, uh, the, abdo in the iota, and then pelvis. Huh? Pelvis and then pneumonia, then upper, then pneumothorax. It's the other way around. Whereas here, what you do is you do quadrant views, quadrantic views in fast. Okay, and which is the first quadrant you normally look at? Right exactly, it is the right upper quadrant that you look at. It is very important to look at it very well because it gives you large amount of data. It's probably the best view available in ultrasounds. Okay, ultrasound you should master the right up to upper quadrant because in the event that a person is coming with hypotension, this is the view that will give you most of the answers. So what? how do you do the right upper quadrant view? And why do you think that this is very good? Um, we, we see Let's take one by one. What should be the, uh, so importantly, what should be the position of the patient? Supine. Supine or Trendelenburg. Mm -hmm. It's supine, you cannot have the patient propped up. Supine or mm -hmm. Trendelenburg. Okay, supine or Trendelenburg is the position that you're going to have. Huh? That is first thing. Then the lights should be dim. Yes. The, the lights, this is part of ATLS, okay? The lights have to be dim. Okay, the lights have to be dim. You know, it's impossible. No trauma surgeon in the world will tell you to dim the lights. Though the protocol says this, nobody will allow you to do that. Okay, but ideally you are supposed to say that lights have to dim because you see the ultrasound properly. Then, which probe do you use? No, you are actually supposed to use a phase direct probe. Because why? Depth is more. Second? Second? Ribs, no? Ribs. You can't see, so ribs will come in the middle now. Okay, but you can use whatever probe you want, but the, 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 the inner array is the one, the phase array is the one that will give you more space to see. Okay, phase array, because between ribs you can't see, ribs get crowded down, huh? you can't see it, you can't see it properly. So, uh, that's why uh, a, a small probe, a phase array probe would be a good way to do this, right? So, how do you do the right upper quadrant view? Take, let's take uh, whatever probe you want, how do you place it, where do you place it? The diaphragm and no, how do you place it? Where is the position? You're from here to here, 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 here. How do you know where to start it with? So, but that is why ATLS has a defined way to do things. Mid exit. Sorry? Mid exit line from here to here. Anterior exit. Mid axillary line is from here to here. So where is the so he's right on the mid axillary? It's not anterior axillary. Okay. Mid axillary, but where to where? You have your mid axillary is all over. You have here to here to where do you? So you should know the HS line. Uh, it's supposed to be at the HS line. Okay, that is in the sub zephoid line. Okay, this line that goes backwards is where you're supposed to first keep your probe with the marker pointing upwards. Huh? The HS line. This is called as the HS line. Okay, that is from the sub zephoid region that goes this way and the mid axillary point that is where you keep your probe. So classically do it like that every time. Okay, you always keep it at the HS line. Okay, the HS line is placed there is where you keep the probe with the marker facing upwards toward the head and the, head and the patient. Right? Now, next step. Next step. After that. No, after that, depth. What is the depth? So, so you have to do the right upper quadrant view well. Otherwise, you will miss out. Okay. So, the right upper quadrant, what is the depth? 16. Okay. You always keep the number at 16. Okay. You keep the number around 16. That's the good starting point. Okay, start at 16. That is where you're going to start. So, right upper quadrant you do by keeping your probe in the HS line in the mid axillary position with the pointer facing upwards. Uh, and then you uh, keep the depth at 16. Clear? Clear? And at that position, you're going to look at the liver. Why is the left upper quadrant more difficult as compared to the right? Take me to work. What I need here. Where are we? Uh, depth is 16. Okay, depth is 16. Why is left difficult than the right? Why do you feel left is difficult than the right? So you have when you say abdominal views fast, we have right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right? Both we are both we are supposed to see. So why is the left more difficult? Left is classically more difficult because of the fact that you are on the other side of the patient in the first place. Isn't it? You are on the other side of the patient. So it is very difficult to put your hand like this. Imagine a patient in trauma, spine board, so many problems occurring, and you have to put your hand over. It's very difficult. 
it's very difficult to do the left upper quadrant view. They will not, you cannot have the time to move your ultrasound figure to the, like in the intensive care unit. It's not possible. You know, that situation is very difficult to actually do. Uh, uh, first thing is that. Second thing is what? Your acoustic window is very small. Why is it small? Uh, liver is more. Late. Yeah, liver is, you actually are going to look at anything inside the chest by having an acoustic window. Mm -hmm. The liver is a big organ. So you have a big acoustic window, so you can look from there inside. But the spleen is a very small organ. So actually getting through and sounding the uh, inside of the chest is very difficult because you the spleen is small. You can't see through that, you know, you can't sound through water. Water is anechoic. Air is an enemy, uh, but water is, and water is something you can you cannot see anything. It's a, it's a, water is an enemy actually to ultrasounds. Okay, so you can't uh, see anything unless the, uh, you know, that's, that's why on the, so what is the position in the left upper quadrant? We said mid axillary line over here with the pointer facing upwards and at the HS line. What is the position in the left upper quadrant? What is the position? Come on quickly. Anterior axillary. Who else says anterior axillary? Who else says posterior axillary? Who else says mid axillary? You say anterior axillary. Okay. Anyone else? Anterior axillary. So the answer is it is as posterior as possible. The posterior axillary line and it is also called as knuckles to the gurney. It is called as knuckles to the gurney. Uh, that means knuckles are be touching the gurney. Gurney is the, uh, the carry the patient. That's the gurney. Okay, the knuckles to the gurney. So it has to be as posterior as possible going upwards knuckles to the gurney. Clear? Clear on this? So it's different. So posterior axillary line in the left upper quadrant and the um, mid axillary line in the right upper quadrant. Alright. So in the right upper quadrant, what are you going to see? The question is that. Amit, what are you going to see in the right? Now that you have started doing ultrasounds, what are you supposed to see in, in when you look at trauma? What are you seeing? In the right upper quadrant, hmm. the visualization of the uh, diaphragm, liver, and what? See, what are we looking at? ATLS. We are trying to figure out is there blood somewhere? Right? We are doing fast to find out is there blood somewhere? What are you looking at? What are you going to look at? So you have to have this very clear, no? What are you going to look at? What are you going to look at? Which is the side you're going to see first? Right. Yeah, so you're going to see you're going to see water. Huh? And what is that sign called as? That sign, what is that sign called as? It's called continuous spine sign. Huh? Continuous spine sign because you're going to have a V line there. What is the V line? Huh? You're going to have a V line here, that's called V line. Okay, you have the liver, you have, you know, this part like this. Uh, uh, so this V line is what is the, is, is, this is called V line. Okay, if you see the spine going ahead, that means there is pleural effusion. It's called the spine, continuous spine sign. Okay, if there is something over here, and in a, in a, in a person who's come from a trauma, trauma, where you're assessing whether what problem is occurring, this will indicate that the patient has got hemothorax. Understand? This will indicate that this is hemothorax. Clear on this? Clear? Huh? So you are looking at that particular young patient who had a motor vehicle accident coming to you and this is what you are seeing. Right? We have not even touched about cervical spine. Cervical spine is completely different. Whether you want to do x-ray, whether you want to do all that, that comes later on. We are now only in ATLS. That is secondary survey. Don't confuse two things. Okay? Cervical spine stability and all that. We have not looked at that. This is ATLS. In ATLS, it's always what you're going to do at that moment. That's why it's so fast. You, you understand? That's why it's so fast. When you go to understanding cervical spine, X-ray, C-spine, all these things, it is secondary survey. It is different. This is primary. <coughs> Someone matter what I'm saying? Oh, differentiate both of them. So when you're talking about ATLS, talking about these things that I'm talking about. Right? Huh? So you are you so in the focus uh, in this. You, if you see this continuous spine sign. This goes in favor in an ATLS patient that there is hemothorax. Now if the patient comes sometime later on and there is becomes more ecogenic, that means becomes white, means that it is some time, one day, so some hours, four hours, three hours later, the clot when it forms, it will become whitish. You should know this because if the patient was transferred from XYZ hospital to your hospital and now is hypotensive, okay, he's been in that hospital for six, seven hours, eight hours and then transferred to higher referral centers and you are doing your primary survey ATLS. Twice, and you see something that is whitish over there, then it means that it has been a while, a clot has been formed and that's why you are getting an ecogenic area. Okay, in the V line. 
Okay, but you still have the continuous diaphragmatic sign. The continuous uh, spine sign. Continuous spine sign. Okay, that's a V line. Clear on this? So first thing you saw is what? The V line. Okay, so the V line. Then continuous spine sign V line. The next thing, Amit. What else you see? So keep your focus this way that you want to look at fluid. You're looking at blood. You know. So now what do you do? Next, next part. So what is that called as? Morrison's fault. It's called a Morrison's fault. So after you see this part, you will see the Morrison's pouch, which is the part between the liver and the kidney. Okay, Morrison's pouch. The Morrison's pouch, you have to see in this area, even if there's a thin sliver of fluid, even if there's a thin sliver of fluid, means there is some bleeding, uh, in, there is some fluid, and this may be the cause of your uh, of your hemorrhage. How much do you how much can you pick up? How much fluid can you pick up in the ultrasounds? The, in, this is intraperitoneum. So the best ultrasound person, best ultrasound person in the world will pick up 300 ml. Okay, huh? the best ultrasound per, uh, person in the world will pick up 300 ml. A person who is just average, like all of us, we will pick up somewhere around 500. And the person who has never done ultrasound will pick up 800. Okay, so uh, you need at least 300 ml. That's why I am telling you, even if a thin sliver car you can pick up, you can pick up, it's, it's actually more than 300. Are you understanding? It's actually more than 300. That, that's why I asked you this question. Right? Huh? So 300 is what you normally pick up. Right? You cannot pick up more than that. This is intraperitoneal, not retroperitoneal. Okay? It is intraperitoneal and not retroperitoneal. Right? So the Morrison's pouch. So where does fluid accumulate first in, in, the, in the abdomen? If the patient has got a trauma, where does fluid accumulate first? No. No. So the answer is, it is actually the paracolic gutter. It is actually the right paracolic gutter. Where is this? It is right here in front of you. Inferior pole of kidney and the liver kibish me jo jaga hai, that is the paracolic cutter. Okay, huh? that is why the next view that you have to see when you are looking at right upper quadrant, apart from the V line, apart from the Morrison's pouch, is the right paracolic cutter, which is the space between the inferior pole of the kidney and the liver. Right? Inferior pole of the kidney. So the area that I am talking of is this part. Okay, that's why when you are doing your ultrasound, you can't just fast it. You have to do it slowly. Okay, you have to do it very slowly. You have to look at the superior pole of the kidney, look at kidney and liver, that is the Morrison's pouch, and then look at the inferior pole to see whether the paracolic gutter is filled or not. Because what we know is that the peritoneal reflection goes and attaches in such a way inside that inferior pole that whatever has to be accumulated will be actually going and accumulating. That's a mesoperitoneal, you know, mesocolic gutter that is actually forms over there. So it's a it's a most dependent part where it goes and accumulates. Okay, it's a right paracolic gutter. Clear? Huh? Right paracolic gutter. It's it's an extension away from the Morrison's pouch, but it's a right paracolic gutter. Right? So when you're when you're doing a fast, you have to look at these parts. You have to look at this. Okay. Now there are certain things that might confound everything over here. When you look at this. One is you might have the presence of a rib. When you, if you have a presence of a rib, it becomes very difficult. Actually, you can see You have a rib marking, black shadow in the middle. It becomes very difficult for you to see what's happening. So the, trip, the trick to that is to go one space lower. Uh, is to go one space lower. And if the patient is breathing, look at that, look at that time. One space lower. Okay, we are at the HS line. No? So we are going to go one space lower. Okay, not fanning it out. The mistake that you do is, you put it in the HS line and then you are fanning it up and down. You don't do it like that. You go one space lower. And then look at it. Because the diaphragm will probably come down, you can actually look at it. Right? Huh? That is one trick. The second thing that you can have in these cases that you must know is that sometimes you may get a hyper echoic area like this. A whitish area here. A whitish area. This whitish area is nothing but fat deposits that many people may have. It may be fat deposits. You should not confuse that to uh, fluid in the pouch. Because you might create major problems if you think that that is the hemorrhage. Okay? So there may be fat deposits. The difference between a fluid and fat deposit is the fact that this area will be hyper equate, will be white and white with a small black sliver. Okay, so it will be white, double, it's called as, what is it, double, I don't know, something called sign, something, something called, okay, where you have two uh, capsules and in the middle there is a small black thing. Okay, so that is normally when there is very nephric fat, which many people have. Okay, so it's one thing that you must, you should look at. Next time when you are looking at these images again and again, no, you will find out, hey, what is this? That is very nephric fat. 
right? So that is the right upper quadrant view. Similarly, you have the left upper quadrant view. The difference is it is no longer in the mid axillary line. This is the posterior axillary line with the knuckles to the gurney with the probe facing upwards, fanning up and down. Huh? So that we can actually look at again the same view. This is a lenorenal space. Okay. And you are going to see the left paracolic cutter. Huh? You are going to see the left paracolic cutter, the lenorenal space and the left paracolic cutter. Clear? Okay. And then you end this by looking at the pelvis. Huh? You end this by looking at the pelvis. All right. Now, before this, uh, in these cases, you normally uh, uh, start by also looking at the heart, subzified approach to the heart. Okay. Why do you do that? Because there's something that will also cause hypotension when you have a telltale injury. That's why the inspection is important for you to understand whether there is anything there. Okay. Inspection. The inspection will actually show you somewhere over there, which can be a steering wheel injury, which has caused the patient to have, uh, to have cardiac tamponade. So what do you look for in this case when you're doing your focus for cardiac tamponade? How do you have to diagnose that? Design. Huh? Design. That's where pulmonary embolism is. So, huh? IVC dilated. So, so IVC dilated is one part that would be there, yes. IVC dilated, but more than that? Uh, you will look at the uh, heart, no? You look at the heart, the long axis view. In the long axis view, when you look at the heart, you may find descending aorta in this, there is blackness here, blackness here. So around the heart, you will find blackness that is here. This is your long axis view. Uh, you might see uh, this over here. Why are you supposed to do it like this? Because if it is not crossing this, if it is not crossing this, it is effusion. It has to cross this. It the long axis. You do the long axis. You do the subzified view to see what the heart is because there are three possibilities. Very rare. So in the rush examination, we do subzified and the long axis view. Why? Because we want to find out the pump problem, which could be either RV, LV, or tamponade. When in the rush examination and hypotension, when you're doing rush examination and hypotension, which is different from the past, what you're going to do there? You're going to look at long axis to actually figure out whether there is this kind of view. You're looking at long axis to figure out whether there is LV contractility problem. You're looking at four chamber apical view to actually figure out whether there is RV dilatation, which is the part of rush examination. You understand? But in this examination, I only want to look at cardiac tamponade. You, you understand? I want to, because there is, no, I'm looking at pulmonary embolism because that's not what I'm looking at here. This is trauma. I'm not looking at uh, LV contractility because this is trauma. You understand? You may want to do it. As you get better and better, you may do everything fast, fast. Uh, but in these cases, you only need to look at whether there is cardiac tamponade. So that the, uh, the, in this one, there is a descending aorta and the fluid crosses between the heart chamber and the descending aorta. Yeah, no, so, we know, right, so this is P lax view, right? Mm. Huh? This is a plax view. In the plax view, you are seeing RV, you are seeing, you know, this is what you are seeing basically. Mm. Huh? So, you have the descending aorta here, right? So, anytime you are looking at plax view, you are cutting it like this. You're cutting it like this, you're seeing the plaques view like this, and you're seeing the descending aorta here. Huh? So, in a patient of cardiac tamponade, you're going to have black here, okay, which is a fluid. Unfortunately, you have to see it crossing the descending aorta. If you don't see it crossing the descending aorta, it is ending somewhere like this. It is somewhere like this. This is actually pleural effusion. You can't go and put a needle inside this. You understand? Huh? To put a needle inside this, you should be certain that this is cardiac tamponade. Right, this cardiac tamponade. In an ATLA scenario, if you don't have a hemorrhage, if you're not feeling anything is there in the Morrison's pouch, then the cause of the hypotension is pericardial tamponade. In an ATLA scenario, you got the point. In an ATLA scenario, if a patient is a young male who basically had a road traffic accident, come to you, steering wheel injury, high velocity MVA, motor vehicle accident, comes to you and is on front of you, hypotension, you're not finding any other source. Femurs are okay, this is okay, everything is okay. It is going to be that. At that point, that's why the ATLA focuses on the heart. Okay, it's going to be that because that means that now I have a potential threat. No, I have a threat. I need to put a needle inside. Clear this? Huh? I, I, that will probably get his hypertension out. Huh? So in circulation, as we discussed, we are going to look at pulse. Huh? We are going to look at PP. Uh, pulse we are going to look at. In pulse, what are we going to look So in, in the circulation, is what are we going to look at? Class 1, class 2, class 3 and class 4. And to identify that, if you identify that, one of the ways to do that is looking at RR and looking at hypotension. Classically, when there is less than 15 to 30 percent, there is no hypotension. There is no hypotension. Once you cross 30 percent, you start getting hypotension, you start getting um, uh, a little bit of altered mental status and you start getting the RR going up. Urine output going down is very late. We are in ATLS scenario here. 
Okay, what also we can figure out when there is 15 to 30 percent is that there is transient improvement in symptoms. Okay, so after giving IV fluid. Okay, so if there is a if there is an ongoing bleed and the bleeding is somewhere around 25 30 percent, you give IV fluid, there will be a transient improvement only to deteriorate further. Okay, if you give IV fluid and it doesn't improve, then you are beyond the 40 percent. You don't give fluid, you and you damage control resuscitation. You have this patient to go and figure out where the bleeding is occurring and arrange for blood. You understand the difference? Huh? So when we are looking at treatment, what are we looking at? If you are given IV fluid, which classically happens in every case, uh, you give IV fluid and the patient transiently improves, you are looking at somewhere around 20-30% of, uh, with the background of having you know the pulses that are palpable, you are looking at 20-30% and probably I can now do it around say that is the time I will do a type and a cross match. I am doing a type and a cross match. Right, because you know that because you know that you have time. Huh? But if you have a patient, you have given fluid and the BP still remains low, and you don't have pericardial tampon, you don't have pneumothorax, you don't have that, something like that. This is not going bleeding. It is not improving. There, there is no cross match. There is type and Z blood. Massive transmission protocol has to be activated. You got the point. You got the point. So you see the difference of how I'm going to do stuff in ATLS protocol. Huh? If I give IV fluid. And classically patient improves, I have time, do a type and a cross match, keep blood reserve ready. Huh? Once I am given IV fruit, it has not improved. No, it is not this time. I can't do a cross match here. Just do a typing and send the patient in. Huh? You send the blood inside. You just ask for the blood and you activate massive transfusion protocol in TP. You understand? Huh? And you do as much as possible damage control resuscitation. You, if the pulse is palpable, don't give the fluid. Huh? Because there are three things that occur in these patients which you have to take care, which is the part of the lethal drive, acidosis. Hypothermia. Hypothermia. Hypothermia and hypotension, Hypothermia. which is now the fourth uh, part of the story. The fourth now is a diamond. It's not a triad. It's a diamond. You know now we, we should call it the lethal triad. Now of late, since the last one or two years, we're calling it as a lethal diamond, where the fourth part is calcium. Okay. Huh? So, uh, but still you must remember this that you need to warm up the patient. The fluid they're giving is warm. And this is one of the places where you want to give warm fluids. Okay, warm fluids and everything that is given is, is kind of warmed up, right? So this is what you come with circulation, right? And this is the time when you go to look at all these other things. For example, you have found out there is a fluid inside, send the patient for immediate surgery. You know, if, if there is no, if there is hypotension going on, there is no point, you open exploratory laparotomy. There is no point of waiting in this case. If his blood pressure is low, there is fluid inside, expert have a CT scan for this. You don't need a CT scan for this. You have found that the bleeding is intraperitoneal, the patient needs to go there. You got the point, huh? You got the point how this works? At that time, you don't resuscitate your patient. It's called damage control resuscitation. If there's a palpable pulse, do not resuscitate your patient. The way to do that is send the patient to the OR. They will resuscitate after they open over there because as of now, the clot and the blood inside is probably serving as a tampon art. Clear on this? Huh? Clear on this? Palpable pulse. You must understand this. This is penetrating trauma or blunt trauma when you talk about it. You have to talk like this. Clear? Circulation is done. So A is done, breathing is done, circulation is done. The fourth thing is disability. That is the next thing. Disability is what we all know about. Checking for everything all across from system wise, you have to check across. That comes in secondary survey. Okay, where you look at um, so in the secondary survey you have a mnemonic. So normally this is a mnemonic of secondary survey. Huh? So decompression. Contusional injury, abrasions, penetrating wounds, burns, traumatic uh, amputations or trauma, laceration, and subcutaneous edema. You want to look at all these things. Decap BTLS. Huh? It is done area wise. This is secondary survey. Right? This is for secondary survey. Huh? This completes your ATLS. This is all that you need to look at. Right? Hmm? Any questions on any of this? So if somebody asks you how do you approach a patient, this is the way you are supposed to say. You understand? Huh? You, uh, in your exam, if it comes, uh, ATLS patient trauma has come to you, this is the way you should approach the patient. You say, I'll first do airway, look at this, 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 this. And the... the... Okay, let's stop this.